The concepts that we've introduced so far in this course, the idea of closeness in Euclidean space, the closure operator for a subspace of Euclidean space, closed sets and open sets, have all been introduced in the service of introducing continuity, which is what we're going to discuss today. Continuity is the most important idea in topology, and here's the definition. Let x and y be two subspaces of Euclidean space. Let me emphasize that the dimension of the ambient Euclidean spaces needn't be the same. m and n can be completely different. They have nothing to do with each other. The definition is that if we have a map f from x to y, we'll say that it's continuous if and only if for every subset s of x and for every point of x that is close to our s, the image point f of x should be close to the image of the subset s. Said differently, f is continuous if and only if the image of the closure is contained in the closure of the image. Now a good practice when you introduce a new definition like this is to find as many different ways of saying the same thing as you can find. So let's do that again. The situation will be exactly the same. We'll have x and y subspaces of Euclidean spaces. And we're going to have ourselves a map f from x to y. And what we're going to do is we're going to give five equivalent characterizations of continuity. The first of these characterizations is simply that f is continuous by the definition that we've just given. That is to say, this is the characterization that says that the image of the closure is contained in the closure of the image. That's equivalent to the following characterization. For every subset t of y of our target, the inverse image of the closure contains the closure of the inverse image. Notice the direction of this subset relationship. In other words, the closure of the inverse image is contained in the inverse image of the closure. That, in turn, is equivalent to the following characterization. For every closed subset, z of y, its inverse image is closed. Now, by taking complements, we have the following equivalent characterization, which is that for every open subset of y, its inverse image in x is open. Now, one important point here is that these four characterizations of continuity don't depend in any serious way on the ambient Euclidean space. I haven't used any notions of distance. I've only used my closure operator and the things that I was able to derive from that closure operator. So here I'm not making any reference to anything special about Euclidean space. That's a fact that we're going to take advantage of when we talk about continuity between general topological spaces. But for now, let's look at this fifth equivalent characterization of continuity, and this is something particular to Euclidean space. It says that for every point, x of x, and for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that for every point y of x that is delta close to little x, f of x and f of y are epsilon close. This is probably the form of continuity that's familiar to you from analysis class. Okay, so now that we've seen the equivalent characterizations of continuity, we should go ahead and jump into examples. The first example is in some ways kind of degenerate, but it's incredibly useful. It goes like this. If we have x and y, both subspaces of Rn, and if x is contained in y, then we can introduce a new map, which we'll call i. That'll be a map from x to y. And it'll be given by this kind of strange rule that says i of x equals x. And in all cases, this is continuous. No matter what x and y, what kind of subspaces those are. This i, this continuous map i, is called the inclusion map. In the particular case where x just simply equals y, we even call it the identity map. Here's an example of a rather different flavor. Suppose that I have two polynomials in n variables, x1 through xn, and let's look at the subset of Rn consisting of those points where the second of these polynomials, q, doesn't vanish. Now we can define ourselves a map, and how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to just take p divided by q. And since q is never zero in u, 
that's a perfectly good map. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, and it's a map that lands in R. And furthermore, it's a continuous map. This is something you will have proved in your analysis course. Another similar fact that you will have proved in your analysis course is that if I take a power series in these same n variables, this is just a, a generic power series. Here I'm using a multi-index alpha to write it down. Well, this will converge on some region. I don't know anything about that region until I analyze it a little bit, but it'll converge on some region. So let's say it converges at least on some open subset u of Rn. Well, then in that case, it will define a continuous map f from u to r. In this course, we're going to consider these as known facts. So this is providing us with a good stockpile of continuous functions, but we can create more continuous functions from existing continuous functions anytime we like. A good strategy for that is the following. I can take two continuous functions and compose them. That is to say, well, if I have subspaces x, y, and z of various Euclidean spaces, then what can I do? Well, if I have two continuous maps, one that starts at x and ends at y, and the other that starts in, at y and ends in z, then I can compose them, and the result will be continuous. Let's keep the examples coming. Suppose that I have three subspaces, w, x, and y, all of various Euclidean spaces. And let's note that we have two maps from x cross y to x and from x cross y to y. What do these maps do? These maps carry a pair x comma y to x or x comma y to y. Let's prove that these maps are both continuous. Okay, so let's use the epsilon delta characterization of continuity and let's prove this carefully. So if we have a point x comma y of x cross y, and if we have an epsilon greater than zero, then I'm in pursuit of my delta. That's the thing I need to do in order to prove that this is a continuous map. In fact, I think I've already found it. I think epsilon should do just fine. So let's see if that's right. I'm going to take a point x prime comma y prime, whose distance from my starting point x y is strictly less than epsilon. And then, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at the effect of this map PR1 here on my point x comma y. So I'm taking x comma y and I'm getting x out, and I'm taking x prime comma y prime and I'm getting x prime out. I'm just getting that first factor. That's what PR1 stands for. It's the projection map onto the first factor. Okay, and so now what do I want to check? I want to check that the distance between these two points is less than the epsilon that I started with. I'm quite fortunate because now what can I do? I can look at the distance from x to x prime, and I can see that it's strictly less than the distance from x to x prime squared plus the distance from y to y prime squared, all square rooted. And why is that? Well, this must be some at least non-negative number. So whatever this quantity is, it must be at least as big as this. But what is this quantity? This quantity is exactly the distance from x comma y to x prime comma y prime. And by assumption, that number is smaller than epsilon, so now we've proven what we want. We've proven that PR1 is indeed a continuous map. The proof that PR2 is a continuous map operates in exactly the same way, except that here we're projecting onto that second factor, so we'll be picking up y and y prime, but our choice of delta will be the same. It'll just be the epsilon that we started with. Okay, but there's more to this story. I have these two special maps, PR1 and PR2, and I claim they're really special. I claim they're special in such a way as to identify continuous maps into x cross y. We've just seen that PR1 and PR2 are both continuous. But now what I claim is that these two maps, which are called the projection maps, are going to help us identify maps from w, this other subspace that we haven't talked about yet, this w into x cross y. So what can happen? Well, we can write down a map, w, into x cross y. Maybe it's continuous, maybe it's not. But here's the claim that I want to make. I'm going to claim that f, our map from w to x cross y, is continuous if and only if, when I compose f with pr1 and pr2, the results of those compositions are both continuous. 
So F here is a map from W into X cross Y. PR1 composed with F is a map from W into just X. Similarly, PR2 composed with F is a map from W into Y. And I say that if both of those maps are continuous, then so is F. And I say that if F is continuous, then so are both of those maps. Well, let's see why. Let's prove it. First, the composition of two continuous maps is always continuous. That's something that we just saw on the previous page. So if F is continuous, and PR1 and PR2 are continuous by what I just proved, it follows that PR1 circle F and PR2 circle F are both continuous. That wasn't so bad. So now let's see the other implication. I want to show that if PR1 circle F and PR2 circle F are both continuous, then F itself is continuous. To prove that, let's use the epsilon delta definition of continuity. So let's assume that these composites, PR1 of F and PR2 of F, are both continuous. Let's let W be a point of W, little w and big W, and let's let epsilon be greater than zero. I need to find a delta now with the property that if W prime is a point of big W and it's delta close to little w, then f of, of w prime will have to be epsilon close to f of w. Okay, well, what do I know I can do? I know that these two maps here, these two composites here, are both continuous. I know that I can find a delta greater than zero, such that if w prime is delta close to w, then both of the following things are going to be true. First, that if I take this number, which I'll call d1, which will be the distance from PR1 of f of w to PR1 of f of w prime, I'll make sure that that d1 is less than epsilon over the square root of 2. And I'll guarantee that the same thing happens for d2. How can I guarantee this? Well, I know that for each of these individually, I can find a delta that will make this happen because of continuity for each of them. And then I'll just choose the smaller of whichever two deltas I'm given. And that way I'm absolutely guaranteed that both of these will be true. Okay, well that's great news. And now what we can do is we can use the same kind of trick that we used last time. Namely, I'm trying to understand the distance from f of w to f of w prime. But remember, this is a distance that's being computed inside x cross y. How do you compute a distance in x cross y? Well, you take the distance in x and you take the distance in y. You square both of them, add them together, and form the square root. So what does that mean? That means that when I contemplate the distance from f of w to f of w prime, it can be no greater than the square root of the sum of the squares of d1 and d2. And by the way that we selected delta, we ensured that d1 and d2 were each strictly less than epsilon over the square root of 2. So our distance here must be strictly less than epsilon. And victory is ours. Let's look at a sub-example of that example just for fun. Now we'll think of the circle as a subset of the complex plane. We're just going to do that to make our equations easy to write down. So this is going to be the set of complex numbers of modulus 1. Well, we can define a map called phi sub a, which will go from s1 to itself. And how will we define it? Well, it'll simply be z goes to z to the a. a here is just some integer, say. And that's a perfectly good continuous map. I can do that for an A, and I can do that for a B, and so I can introduce a new map here, which is continuous as well, which I'll call phi AB. That'll be a continuous map from S1 into S1 cross S1, and it'll carry Z to Z to the A, comma Z to the B. S1 cross S1, remember, is this torus. It's the surface of this donut here. And so what's happening? What does this map look like? Well, the A is telling you how many times to go around one of the two circles, and the B is telling you how many times to go around the other of the two circles. The A is telling you how many times you're going around the tube like this. The B is telling you how many times you're going around the circle like this. These are the two circles that make up the torus here I'm going to take a trip starting here. I'm going to go around the torus 
and I'm going to go around the torus this way as well, and I'm going to go around the torus in this direction, say b times, and I'll go around the torus in this direction, say a times. And so perhaps the path that you take will end up looking something like this. I went around this outer circle one time, but I went around this circle, the tube circle, two times. Pardon me while I have a strange interlude. Now we're going to introduce another important concept, which is the concept of sameness in topology. Again, we're going to start with our two subspaces, X and Y, of some Euclidean space. Once again, M and N need have nothing whatsoever to do with each other. A homeomorphism from X to Y is a continuous bijection, F, from X to Y, whose inverse, F inverse, is also continuous. So there are three conditions here. First, that F be continuous as a map. Second, that F be a bijection. And third, that its inverse, which exists because it is a bijection, also be continuous. All three of these have to be in play in order to have a homeomorphism. And it's in this circumstance that we're prepared to say that X and Y are the same. X and Y are quote-unquote the same in topology, if and only if there's a homeomorphism connecting them. Well, let's formalize that. We'll say that these two subspaces, X and Y, are topologically isomorphic, or sometimes people just simply say homeomorphic, if and only if there is a homeomorphism from one to the other. Notice that there, if there is a homeomorphism from one to the other, then there's a homeomorphism going in the opposite direction too, because I can simply take the inverse of the map that you gave me. So now let's emphasize with this example that homeomorphism completely destroys distance information. I'm going to take the open interval from 0 to 1, and I'm going to take the entire real line. We are used to thinking of these as very, very different. However, from a topologist's eyes, they're exactly the same. And here's why. I'll write down a map, f from the real line to the open interval from 0 to 1. And how will I do that? Well, I'll just take 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x. It is continuous. Actually, you can tell that just by writing down a power series representation of this thing. And furthermore, it's a bijection. The range of this function is exactly the open interval from 0 to 1. So we certainly have a continuous bijection, but that's only two of the three ingredients we need. We need to make sure that its inverse is also continuous. So what is its inverse? Well, a quick computation will reveal to you that its inverse is minus log of 1 minus x over x. Well, that too is a nice analytic function that's given to you by a power series representation, which converges on this open set g here is indeed a nice continuous function. So now I have f, which is a continuous bijection, and I have its continuous inverse. That means that r is topologically isomorphic, or more briefly, homeomorphic, to the open interval from 0 to 1. Topologically speaking, the real line is no different from the open interval. Distance isn't important in topology. Closeness is important, but distance isn't. Let's look at another surprising example of a homeomorphism. So suppose that I have two subspaces, X and Y, of Euclidean space as always, and suppose that I have a continuous map. Let's consider the graph of F. The graph of F is going to be a subset of X cross Y. It's going to consist of the points of x cross y such that y equals f of x. When you think about graphing a function in grade school, you're literally drawing a picture of this subspace of x cross y. Normally x and y, in grade school at least, are subsets of r itself. But this, set, this subspace makes perfect sense regardless. So this sits inside x cross y, but of course x cross y sits inside rm plus n, because x sat inside rm and y sat inside rn. And so this is now a subset of Euclidean space, and so I'll regard it as a subspace of Euclidean space by remembering my notion of closeness. But surprise, this topological space is actually homeomorphic to x itself. That is to say, it's exactly the same as x 
through the eyes of a topologist. More precisely, I claim that we have a bijection, capital F I'll call it, from the graph down to x. Well, what is this bijection? Well, it's simply given by x comma y goes to x. Why is this a bijection? For every point x, there exists a unique y such that y equals f of x, which is to say there's a unique point in the inverse image of x. That's exactly what it means to be a bijection. Okay, but what about its inverse? Well, let's think about it. Its inverse is the map g from x to gamma of f that carries little x to x comma f of x. So let's now prove that both f and g really are continuous maps. f is, remember, just given to you essentially by the projection onto the first factor, and g is given to you by taking x to x comma f of x. So how do we see these things are continuous? Well, for f, something is much stronger is true. The map PR1 from x cross y to x, which carries x comma y to x, it's the same assignment, c, but I'm just thinking of this as a bigger space than just the graph. It's really the entire x cross y. That map is definitely continuous. We proved that on the other page. This map PR1, remember, is what we called the projection. Okay, well that was easy. Let's see about g. Is g also easy? Well, yeah, it turns out it really is. To see that g is continuous, well, I can think of it as a map, not just from x to gamma of x, but even to all of x cross y. When I say that I can think of it that way, I mean that I can check continuity for this map, and that will be just the same as checking continuity for the map that lands in gamma of f. So I want you to think about why that is. Once you've thought about why that is, you'll then see that if I'm thinking about a map from x into x cross y, and I want to check that it's continuous, well then what can I do? I can compose it with my projections onto the first and second factor and see whether those maps are continuous. And if both of them are continuous, then my original map is continuous, and I can declare victory. Well, what does this composition do here? Well, it starts off with an element x of x, and g of x, what does that do? Well, g of x carries little x here to x comma f of x. That's nice. And then the first projection just projects off that first factor. So this composite map here, this long map here from x to itself, turns out to just be the identity map. Okay, and what about g composed with the projection onto the second factor? If I start off with the point little x in x, g is telling me to go to well, x comma f of x again. And then when I project onto the second factor, I just get f of x. In other words, this long map here from x to y, this composite, is just the map f. And we started off by assuming that f was continuous. So the identity is continuous, and f is continuous, and therefore the map g is also continuous. And since the map G is continuous, and since you did your little exercise to make sure that it really is fair to say that now G regarded as a map from X to gamma of F is also continuous. So think about what that does. That means that if you have a continuous function, no matter how nutty it is that you've written down, and by the way, continuous functions come in all kinds of crazy shapes and sizes, there are continuous functions that are nowhere differentiable, for example. But if I think about the graph of a continuous function on the real line, and I look at that graph as a topological space, that's exactly the same as the line I started with. There's no difference here. Topologists don't see how jagged that drawing on the top is. A topologist says that's a line. It's a squiggly line, but it's a line just as well. We'll see a lot more of these examples, but let's see a non-example. Here's an unexample. Let's consider the map, I'll call it E, from the half-open interval from 0 to 1 to the circle. And again, I'm going to think of the circle as sitting inside the complex plane, just so I can write down an easy formula. Well, I'm going to let E of t be exp of 2 pi i times t. So I'm just going to take my half open interval, which looks like that, and I'm going to wrap it around the circle. That's exactly what this function is doing. It's certainly continuous. It's a nice power series, so I'm not worried about that. It's certainly a nice continuous function. 
it's even a bijection as well. So it's a continuous bijection, but it is very much not a homeomorphism. If you try to consider the inverse function to this, that inverse exists, but it won't be continuous. This is not a homeomorphism. And that's somewhat good news, that's somewhat encouraging, because after all, the half-open interval and the circle, those don't really look very much alike at all. It would really be quite disturbing if this were a homeomorphism, and I'm relieved it's not. Okay, so that's not a homeomorphism, but that didn't actually prove that those two spaces aren't homeomorphic. Just because we have a certain map that's not a homeomorphism, that doesn't rule out the possibility that there's another map, another homeomorphism, that connects the half-open interval and the circle. Maybe they're secretly topologically isomorphic by some other crazy map that I just haven't thought of yet. Well, it turns out that's not going to be the case, and that's good. So these two are not topologically isomorphic. But how would you ever prove that two things are not topologically isomorphic? There's probably an infinite number of continuous bijections between 0 and 1 and S1. You can't check that all of those inverses aren't continuous by hand. That would be crazy. Instead, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to introduce our first serious concept of topology. We're going to introduce invariance. Things that can rule out the possibility that there are any maps whatsoever that could exhibit S1 and the half-open interval as topologically isomorphic. Those invariants are pretty powerful. Here's another example of the kinds of things that those invariants can do. Suppose that we consider the subspace y of the plane consisting of those points x, y, where y has absolute value 1. What does that look like? Well, it's the disjoint union of these two vertical lines inside the plane. This looks, through human eyes, very different from the real line R, but maybe still somehow they're topologically isomorphic. Once again, how can we rule that out? The invariance, and in particular the notion of connectedness that we're going to talk about next time, is going to do that for us. It's going to tell us that that can't happen. The same kind of thinking is going to allow us even to show that the real line, R1, and the real plane, R2, are also not homeomorphic. <laughs>